Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 143, we're going to talk about match components and why they matter so much. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, I spent the last three days matching capacitors for the upcoming Universal Phono Kit Preamp, which will be going out to test builders by early September. And I realized this would be a good topic for Tube Lab. Maybe not everybody understands the, the fine, um, the importance of the fine matching of some components. So today we're going to go, we'll look at a typical audio system and identify those components that need to be matched for best sonics. The great authority on analog audio, Michael Fremer, has been quoted many times as saying, in audio, everything matters. Now, I totally agree with this, but I often add to it with, in audio, everything matters, but some things matter more. Okay, let's figure out. What matters more? Okay, so this is a typical system. Well, at least it's it's one of our systems. So you're gonna have a preamp of some sort, and if it's a tube preamp, and it should be, because they sound great, if you have, let's say, a, a pair of 6SN7s, you're gonna want them matched electrically. And we'll look at those in just, actually, I've got some here, hang on a second. So let's just get them out. I've got a bunch of props. And we're going to go down to the component level at some point. So here's one of my favorite 6SN7s. Now, this is a rebranded Sylvania. Philco actually was the, uh, the radio division of Sylvania. I think they started off as their own company, and then Sylvania bought them. I'm pretty sure that's how it worked out. But anyways, for much of Philco's life, Sylvania owned them. And, of course, the equipment came out with tubes, re Sylvania tubes rebranded Philco. They obviously always supplied it. There is the um, 6SN7 GTA historic uh, logo. They're often faded like this. Um, even new old stock, they're just these tubes are getting very old. They were made in the early 1950s. This is the back-to-back T-plate -back with full chrome. I love the sonics of this tube. This would... If you, if you said, Jim, uh, you're getting the Desert Island treatment and you, you can bring, you know, two preamp tubes for <laughs> your universal, these would be the tubes I would bring with me. And they're getting harder and harder to find. So look at the numbers on these things. So 88 is the first section. That's the gain stage in, in this preamp. And 95 and 95 is the follower section. So with vintage tubes, 10% deviance for most tubes, both um, both voltage gain, so preamp tubes or driver tubes or phase inverter tubes, a 10% variance is just fine. Same for power tubes with their, with their emissions, their milliamps. 10% I would consider very good. A 5% deviation between sections. Now, remember, this is your first section. That's your second section. So we're not talking about from first to second. We're talking about apples to apples, right? First to first. Well, that's a dead match. But 95 to 99, 4 on top of 99, that's basically 4%, right? Anything 5% and better in a vintage tube, I consider to be a perfect match. That's... They don't get much better than that, even in two two runs or, or close a, a, a case, let's say, of of a certain type of tube, uh, in which you've got fifty. Well, twenty five and for power tubes is pretty common, but twenty five, fifty, or a hundred is are your common numbers in a case. Um, even a close matched manufactured run in which the tubes are tight. Um, you're not going to find very many tubes inside of 5%. 5% is great. Okay, so let me put these somewhere safe so don't crash them. So tube matching is really important. We're going to talk about why all of this is so important 
after we run through some of these examples. So obviously if you've got some mono blocks, if you're running stereo, you're like most of us, you're going to have a match pair of mono blocks with match tubes, right? We're talking same thing as the preamp. And in stereo, of course, you're going to have a left and right speaker and you're going to have a matched pair, right? Now, way back when I was a, a young audiophile, back in the 70s, which were a lot of fun in audio, let me tell you. The audio wasn't that great, but we were having fun. <laughs> it was a wild, wild west of audio back then. Um, be the better speaker manufacturers were actually putting um, uh, serial numbers on their speakers, and the, the better audio stores were selling consecutive pairs because they deemed that to be that important to have a, a close matched manufactured pair of speakers. And I think they were right. You rarely see serial numbers these days on speakers. Um, you know, because it costs money, it takes time. Um, and of course, that means that everybody in the supply chain has got to pay attention. <laughs> and what did, what did Michael Fremer said? Everything matters. And of course, if you're buying speakers from a big box store, well, you know, forget it. Okay, so what's next? Cables. Everything has got to connect up, right? So now we're only going to touch on cables. These are my favorite cables. These are blue jeans. These are LC1s. LC stands for low capacitance. Now, obviously, you're not going to mix and match manufacturers, and um, and you're going to try not to do this. You're going to try not to change the length of the cables, right? You're going to try to keep them identical as match pairs. And the reason for that is all components in audio, well, all components, period, have a certain amount of capacitance. But wire length, wire gauge, and wire length and construction affect the capacitance of cables quite a bit. So you can have, uh, let's say, a standard three foot or one meter patch cord with from blue jeans and LC1 will have very low capacitance. In fact, it'll it'll be pretty close to the, an industry leading low capacitance. Or you can have, you know, some nameless cable, unbranded, rebranded, whatever, um, that uh, has got very high capacitance. So why does capacitance matter in the interconnects? Because capacitance can change the EQ of the signal. And if you change the EQ of the signal, you've basically um, changed your sonics. And in the case of um, patch cord length, between most components, it doesn't matter that much. If you went, let's say, from an 18-inch cable to a 36-inch and a left-right channel, except in the case of going from your turntable to your phono preamp, in which case you've got a very low signal, you've got um, you've got a, a RIAA um, EQ in which the bass is down 20 dB and the treble is up 20 dB. Folks, that's huge. If if you ever want to hear that difference, just plug your turntable straight into your well. You can't plug it straight into your preamp unless you've got a very high gain preamp, but maybe you do and turn the volume right up. Do it carefully, and it's gonna sound like shite, but we've gotta take that that uh, mastered EQ on vinyl, on your records, and we've gotta we've got boost the, the bass substantially and drop the treble substantially. So if your cables between your turntable and your phono preamp have mucked up the EQ before you've even applied um, the equalization in the phono preamp, well, you're going to have a lot of problems. And so cables matter a lot, particularly the capacitance of cables. But length can matter as well. So changing the capacitance with two different lengths going to your phono preamp would be a really bad idea. Okay, what else? Well, let's get a schematic out because what I really want to talk about is small components. 
So this is the Universal 6 or 12 SL7 phono preamp. And here are the tubes. Now this is just one channel, right? It's a dual mono design. It's the only way to design preamps, in my opinion. Uh, even power amps. I'm a huge fan of mono blocks. So I'm going to show you the 6SL7. Now this is the 12 volt version, so it's the 12 SL7, and so this is the gain stage. There's two gain stages per channel, and this is the CF or cathode follower stage. Yeah, are we off? Yeah, let me get this on channel here. Let's get you in focus <laughs> so you can see what's going on. Okay, so we have two gain stages. We bring the voltage way up, we apply the EQ in between. We're going to look at this in detail in just a minute. And the cathode follower sends off a low impedance signal for easily driving the cables into the control preamp. So we're only going to use one half of this tube for each channel. But look, it's balanced. It's perfectly balanced, actually, within the capability of the tester. And the, the tester has a plus or minus probably about 1.5%. So, you know, the, all testers are like that. So, um, they're going to have a little bit of a variance. But we use one of these 12 SL7s, these high gain tubes, in each channel. And they're balanced. They don't have to be balanced because each stage has only has to be matched to each stage. So this is the way it would work, right? So this is your first gain stage. That's your first gain stage. So they're actually perfectly matched. But this could be 80 and 80. So, or it could be 82 and 80. This is your second stage. Okay, so everybody understands, I think, that importance of that. So that's tube matching, right? Now let's get these out of the road. But what about the components? Ah, okay. That's really what Jim wants to talk about, and it is. What matters with the components? And what the heck did I spend three days matching? Well, if we follow the circuit along here, we've got a, a load resistor of 47K. Now, we bring in... The, the kit amp business has gotten to the point where we're bringing in parts in units of 500 and 1,000. And... It means, of course, that we've got a huge amount of money invested in inventory. But if you want quality parts, you bring them in in large quantities. So most modern resistors that are going to be used for most components, not power supply and special applications, are going to be metal film. And they are going to be 1% components. So when an order comes in like this, all I need to do is spot check the resistors to make sure, in fact, they put the right value into the bag. And I want to see if we're within that, that plus or minus 1%. And if we are, then I don't need to do matching with resistors because they're normally manufactured for a very tight specification. And when we pull uh, an order and we start f filling component bags, if I need two of these, I'm going to take two consecutive ones. Okay, so that's how resistors end up fairly closely matched without any stress. Easy peasy, right? What about critical components in something like a phono preamp? Well, the EQ components are much more important. You can see how I trimmed an 18K with a, 9, with a 1K. There is no 19K resistor. Now, we could have stopped at 18K and called it good, but live testing and um, sweeps of the preamp showed that that 1K trimmer made a, quite a bit of a difference. So, it made the circuit slightly more complicated, but the cost difference and the time to assemble it really is negligible. So, we're going to want to do that. But here's where really gets important. These are the EQ capacitors. All these components here, everything, the impedance of the tube here, this this resistor here that helps set the impedance of this whole thing here, <clears throat> these resistors, 
these capacitors. Everything sets that equalization. So, and some of these components are really, really important. So here is the 3.3 nanofarads. And this is, this is this capacitor right here, C5. And this is how they're going to arrive in the parts bag. And the reason for that is because it'll be very, very easy to mix up capacitors. So they're going to arrive like this. And what I did was we had an order of, I think, a thousand of each type. And, um, and what I did was I, depending on what type of component it was and what the tolerances were, I, ma I matched them to either a 1% or a 1.5% tolerance, which is really very close. But it takes a lot of time <laughs> and you need a lot of components. So you got to go through, you have to touch, test each and every one and sort them into their broad categories. So what else matters in this circuit? So the capacitors, absolutely. Um, we already talked about how the resistors tend to be not a problem because they're metal film 1%. If we move along here, we can see that we've got another trimmer capacitor right here. This is the roll off at the high frequencies. And this actually is not quite as important as the 3.3 nanofarad, the 160 picofarad, but it's still quite important. So they got matched as well. And of course the tubes we were talking about, that's important as well. Now, why does all of this matter? Well, if you're running stereo, and almost everyone is, the left-right volume matching is going to be very important. If you get the, um, the, the gain of your tubes that you've installed is mismatched across the, the uh, first section, and in, you know these are twin, twin triodes, so if your first section to first section is mismatched, or your second section to your second section is mismatched, then your volume is going to be different on your left and right channels. Now, if your volume is different, your stereo image is going to collapse. It's going to, it's not going to be there and you're going to lose your sound stage completely. And the other interesting thing is you're not going to hear all the music as it was mastered. And you would think, well, do you know if, if I'm down a little bit on my left channel, it's not going to be that bad, is it? It's going to be terrible. You wouldn't believe the difference when you lose some volume on one channel because when the stereo um, mix is done, when it's mastered, that engineer is listening really carefully to left-right balance and to what he wants or she wants in the left channel, the right channel, and what, what they want the center channel to sound like. Yes, there's an imaginary center channel, it's, it doesn't physically exist as a speaker. It doesn't exist in the mastering studio. They're running a left and right speaker, right? And they're mixing down to a left and right channel. But they, they create through the magic of the actual original recording and the mastering process, they create that phantom center channel, which is normally going to be the vocals, pretty close front center, maybe up a little bit, but there may be other things. They may stick the drums right uh, in the high in the back, though very typically in a lot of music, especially traditional jazz, the drums will be on the left or on the right solidly, and maybe the sax will be on the right. If there's a vocalist, they'll be front and center. Anyways, that all of this comes down to the final sonics. If you pay attention to the details and everything matters, you're going to have a much, much better sound stage and you're going to hear the recording as it was originally mastered, or at least as close as you can get. Okay, well, hopefully that helps everybody out creating great sound. Now, what's been going on over at Melatone Kits? Well, as I mentioned, we're working on getting a small run of universal phono kit preamps ready, and we're almost there. The parts, I think we've got 99.9% .9 of the parts have come in. And the real exception is that 
we don't have the top plates yet. And we've, we tried to subcontract the top plates. It didn't work out. We actually tried to subcontract the plinth work and that didn't work out. Well, it sort of worked out and then it didn't, but anyways, so we're going to have to take control of manufacturing everything. And that's what Charles is working on. He's working, he's been working for a month on getting our CNC fully operational for production work. And then we can make the plates for the universal phono preamp. We can make a production run for the GU50. The GU50 model blocks actually have all the components ready to go. Um, everything right down to the boxes, which are huge. Um, but we don't have the plates. So anyways, as soon as he gets that up and running, we're going to start running plates. And as soon as I'm done this video, I'm actually making plate stock for him. So he's getting close. Okay. And what came in this week? Well, lots and lots of EL 34s. So hang on a second. Let me go get them. Well, before we look at the EL 34s, Let's take a look at a fairly, what's become a fairly rare tube. Um, they always were a rare tube, but they become even rarer. This is the standard bottle Tungsol 6SN7 GTB. They're angled plates. And there's a, there's a few versions of the GTB tongues. There's the really high demand tall boy, which is really quite tall glass. It, they're big, sexy tubes. There's an earlier version with mouse ears, micas on each side to dampen the tube. Those were very much mil-spec tubes. And there's the standard bottle. And the standard bottle doesn't have quite as much demand, but the interesting thing is the standard bottles sound almost identical to the tall boys. <laughs> so they're a little cheaper. We found a few of them. So we've got a couple of matched pairs. I mean, problem with um, the problem with tongue saws, well, the great thing about tongue saws is that they, they do everything really well and they have some of the best detail of any 6SN7 ever made. Um, but the problem is many of them tend to be a little noisy and I don't mean like crackly, crackly noisy, but just enough noise on the speakers that when we do a live test and we test all of our tubes that we have amps for live um, after we've got them matched and just before we ship so when we ship we know that about 90 percent of the tubes that go out the door we've actually listened to them we listen to them for low noise we've checked for microphonics and we're listening for quality sound i think that any good uh, tube retailer should be doing that and many are but when I say a little bit of noise, we have to get our ear up into the tweeter carefully. <laughs> you don't want anybody fiddling around with the volume control at that point. And at a normal listening level, we're listening for a little bit of uh, white noise usually is what you hear. But sometimes you hear some other exciting things like crackling and, um, and the tube actually, the electric shifting inside the glass. Now, that's a normal sound for a tube. And if it stops after the tube's warmed up, that's fine. So long as it's not too loud on the speakers, that's normal. And often when we plug in a tube that hasn't been in service for 25, 50 years, even longer, they have to, the electrics have to sort of seat themselves in the glass. They'll move around. Remember the expansion rates of the components are different. That's why the mica has all these little fingers so that it can, everything can sort of nestle and adjust without anything breaking, right? Because we have hard wire connections down here. And of course, we have glass around our, our components. Um, but so long as that, often that re resetting of the components on the first warming up of a tube will be the only time it'll make that kind of crinkly kind of, it's really an interesting sound. It's, it's, it's like the tube's coming alive. It doesn't happen that often. So anyways, that's the problem with the tongues, unfortunately, is that even new old stock ones will have a little bit of noise. So that makes a rare tube even rarer because we don't sell those tubes. In fact, we throw them out. I once had a, a, a wholesaler that I was arguing with. I, I said, look, the tubes are, this tube's noisy, that tube's noisy. And, um, and he, said, he said, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, that's perfectly normal. And um, I'd like, 
I'd like to have all of your thrown out tubes. And I thought, I bet you would. You'd sell them again, you bugger. Anyways, so we throw them out. <laughs> we don't keep bad tubes for any purpose whatsoever. We don't discount them. We just get rid of them. Um, okay, let's take a look at the EO34s that came in. Charles found a whole bunch of these RFTs. Some of them are rebranded Siemens. Now, Siemens was probably one of the top um, tube and electronics manufacturers back in the day. And S Siemens, when they stopped manufacturing their own EL34, they, um, as far as I know, all the EL34s they carried were these East German RFTs. And the RFT is probably one of the, the most underrated, least known, high quality vintage EL34s out there. They do absolutely everything well. They're rock solid tubes. They're long lived tubes. And they have one of the best levels of detail of any power tube ever made, particularly in the EL34 um, type. And, and I love the sonics of the EL34. It's a warm, rich sound, perfectly suitable to jazz, to acoustic music, to the sort of uh, modern world uh, jazz that I love so much. Anyways, a whole bunch of these came in. And best of all, a lot of them are testing, high testing, close to the new old stock used. And that makes them a heck of a bargain because the... Power tubes just don't last long. So if you can get uh, a high testing young quad at a use price, then you're going to have a long lived quad of power tubes. Always get a spare match tube if you can when you buy your quad. That will mean that your quad will be in service for years. And he also, Charles also found a few of the probably the highest demand EL34. Uh, vintage EL34 out there, and that is the Wing C's. These actually have the Wing C's logo. logo. Some of them will have a stylized S for Svetlana. And be careful, there are a lot of copies and fakes of this tube. Anytime you have a high demand tube, you're going to have people copying it either legitimately or fraudulently. <laughs> So, and none of the copies, and of course, none of the fakes sound anything like the real deal. These have that warmth and the richness in the mid-range of the Mullard XF2. And they're probably the closest tube to the Mullard. They don't quite have the same level of detail as the RFTs. So, there's, there is that. And with everything in audio, it's a trade-off, folks. So... If, if you prefer the micro detail, you're going to love the RFTs. If you want a full, warm, rich presentation, you probably would prefer the Wing C or the Mullard XF2 would just blow you away. <laughs> of all the tubes we ever sell and get comments back from buyers, it's the Mullard XF2s. Um, I, I get almost every set I sell, somebody will send back a reply saying, Wow, that's usually how the emails start. Wow, I, you know, I've read the hype. Everybody says the same thing, and now I'm adding to the hype. They, they sound amazing. Okay, well, if you stay to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out, and we've got a hidden code at the end here. You can probably figure out what it is. And we've got flat rate shipping around the world of $20. And you can reach almost everybody for that. Sometimes there's a very small additional charge, but we get to about, oh, 95, 98% of you for that. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun. This is Jim, missing Charles, but hopefully he'll be back next week, signing off. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>